everyone, my name is Sarah and I am a DIY blogger and maker and I am so excited to be with you guys this afternoon to show you a little bit about working with FEMO. So I partnered with FEMO today and you can find them on Instagram at Stadler North America and I encourage you guys to follow them there to see the latest about what new products, um, techniques and inspiration. And if you guys are creating with FEMO today, I encourage you to tag FEMO in any of your posts. You can use the hashtag MyFEMO or Stadler underscore NA, that's for North America. And they would love to see what you're creating and possibly reshare as well. So today what we're gonna focus on is kind of an overview of jewelry making, particularly earrings. And then we're gonna do a little bit of bead making for necklaces at the end with polymer clay. So some of you guys I know reached out to me and you're new to working with polymer clay and have a ton of different questions. So I'm gonna try and cover as much as I can today, but if you do have any questions, please use the chat here in Zoom and we will try and answer those as we go. Feel free to stop me at any point if you have questions. I would love to answer them to my best of my ability. And if I can't answer them, I'm sure someone from the team of FEMO team would be able to do that as well. So what we're going to start with is kind of an introduction to color mixing, the basic tools that we're going to use. I'm going to show you about five different techniques to customizing your clay. Then we're going to go over cutting it out, assembling, baking and assembling, and then bead making. So let's go ahead and get started. So I have a bunch of different FEMO soft clay. That's the clay that I'm going to be working with today. It's my favorite clay to work with um, because as the name implies, it's soft. It's really pliable. It's nice and easy to work with, um, especially if you're new to working with polymer clay. I think it's a great place to start. I have eight of my favorite colors here, but if you are interested, they have over 15 colors available at Michael's now. So there's definitely colors for everyone. And I'm sorry for the airplane noise. Um, that will happen maybe intermittently, so we'll try and uh, just <laughs> roll with it. But what we're gonna start with today is basic color mixing and what tools we can use for that. So to begin, there's two different tools that are so important to working with polymer and clay. And there kind of depends on what supplies you already have on hand or kind of how committed maybe you want to be to polymer clay. So this right here is a clear acrylic ruler. It is the basic tool that you need for any type of working with um, female clay. And it's just like a rolling pin. If you make cookies or pie crust, you're just going to use it like that. This machine over here, um, which we thought looked like a pasta maker, is called a clay machine. And this is made by FEMO as well. And I'm gonna be particularly, primarily using this tool today because it's just a little bit quicker. Um, if you are like, wanna just jump into polymer clay and you absolutely love working with it, this is a really affordable um, tool to get. And it's a great investment because it just like expedites the process and makes things really nice and easy. So I'm gonna focus on that, but everything that I'm making today can be done with the roller as well. So you might just want to start with working with one particular color. Maybe you see a color right here that you absolutely love and you just want to jump in and you can use it as is, which I do plenty of times. But for the earrings that you see kind of on the back over here on the top, all of those I made custom colors to get those particular colors using just a few of these colors that you see here. So I'm going to show you guys a little bit about basic color mixing and as well as marbling, because they kind of go hand in hand. So the first technique I'm gonna show you guys is marbling. So I'm gonna use two particular colors, a dark blue and a white Fimo clay. And this is a fun technique that you may see. It's so popular in jewelry making. The tool that I'm gonna be using a lot is a metal scraper by Fimo. They also have the one that you see here that comes in a set of three different blades with a little grip, which is really nice to use as well. This is available at Michael's in the new FEMO section. But I'm gonna be using this one, um, just I'll show you guys a few things that I love about this one. This is a scraper that's great for cutting the clay, but as well as picking it up and moving it to our surface. So I'm gonna use this tool to cut the clay. You'll notice that the clay has eight different little segments or ridges here. That's just a really helpful guide for measuring. So that way when you're color mixing or kind of trying to distribute the clay, like maybe making beads or something like that, you can use this as a measurement. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with three segments of white. And this is just a technique I'm gonna show you guys for marbling. And then we're gonna go into color mixing. 
So I'm going to grab my white clay and then my dark blue clay, which I think this is Windsor blue. I'm going to use my tool here. And before you begin, one of the um, important steps that I did before you guys joined me today is I cleaned my work surface here. So I'm using this marble slab to work on. Um, you can also use a clear acrylic sheet. Those are available at Michael's in the FEMO section. I chose the marble today because it's not as reflective so you guys can see what I'm doing a little bit better. But you could also use a, a ceramic floor tile that you get at the home improvement store. Anything that's non-porous and smooth works great for working with your clay. Before you begin, you wanna use a baby wipe or an alcohol wipe to go ahead and clean off the entire surface and your hands. If you have any dust that you might not even be able to see, but you're working with clay, especially the light colors, your dust is gonna go into the clay. So you want to make sure that everything is free of dust and dirt and debris as well. If you were previously working with clay, you may have little bits of the colors on there. So you wanna make sure it's nice and clean before you begin. So I have two colors here and you'll notice right away that the Fimo Soft, you might be like, wait, it's actually kind of hard. You just have to use it kind of work with it, mold it with your hands a little bit. And as soon as your kind of hands work with it and your body temperature gets on there, it's gonna soften right away. So I'm just gonna mold this a little bit. And then I'm gonna use my hand to go ahead and make a little rope. Now this is something that you probably, um, even if you're new to crafting or anything like that, you're probably familiar with this technique. Maybe you learned it in uh, elementary school working with clay or maybe play-doh or something like that but i'm just going to make a little rope here and use my fingers to spread it out then i'm going to take my secondary color and this is the windsor blue the kind of navy blue and i'm just going to mold that as well and one thing i want to show you guys is that the blue you can kind of see on my hands the blue is already kind of rubbing off on my hands so it's something you want to be mindful of before you work with another color so i'm just going to roll this out into like a little noodle here. And then I'm going to twist them together. And you'll see I have twice as, or three times as much white over here as I do blue because I wanted to have more white in this mix. And I'm just rolling them out into a little rope here. Then I can fold them in half. And one thing that I love working with the clay, especially creating either custom colors or blends, it's very forgiving and it's kind of fun to kind of just embrace the organic quality of it and kind of see what you come up with as you create. Once you've made a few things with it, you'll kind of get a little bit of a hang of it or a pattern. You know, you'll know that you want to twist it maybe two or three times every single time to get a specific technique. But right now you'll see I'm just rolling it. And as I roll, it's going to twist and start to create that marble effect. I'm gonna fold it in half and roll it back again, and then roll that together. And you'll repeat this, and you'll notice I'm just using my hands for this part, and so you get the desired effect. But before we can make earrings or any flat pieces, we're obviously gonna to have to roll it out so I'm going to go one more time and then show you what that looks like. So I'm just twisting it into a coil here or like to a little rope. And the more times I do this, the more blended the color is going to be. And now it's getting kind of a denim blue color, which is really nice. So I'm going to go ahead and twist it one more time and then we're going to roll it out and see what it looks like. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna do that. And then I'm gonna start with a acrylic ro uh, roller so you guys can kind of see what this looks like here. And if you are using the acrylic roller as your primary uh, tool for rolling out the clay, one little tip you can do is actually put rubber bands on either end. Just make sure you wrap them around the same amount of times on the left and right end. And that's gonna give you like a little guide to how far off the work surface it stands up. It's a little trick from um, baking that works great with the clay as well. And that's just gonna ensure that you get even um, height or even uh, pressure as you roll. So I'm just using my hands here to roll this out and it created a really beautiful marble effect. If you're not happy with that, go ahead and twist it again and kind of see what 
you can create there. One thing I'm gonna do is show you guys, use the scraper to lift it up off my surface because sometimes it does get a little stuck on there. I'm gonna fold this in half and put it in the clay machine. <clears throat> Now, if you are using the clay machine that has little numbers right here on a knob, this, if you've used the pasta maker, same kind of thing, it tells you how thick it is. For earrings, I like to use two, which is two millimeters. That's what I've used for all these earrings here. If you want them a little bit thicker, I would recommend going with one, but that I found is a great setting for using the other tools that I'm gonna show you for making holes afterwards. And that's one millimeter thick. And you can kind of measure it if you want, um, if you're hand rolling as well to see the thickness. I'm gonna place it in here and then it has a little handle here that you just crank. And you'll see right away that it instantly rolled it out into one nice even surface. So if Sarah? you were happy with the cut, yes, go ahead. Um, just wanted, uh, there was a question, um, can you ever overwork the clay in your opinion? Um, I personally don't think so. Um, it's kind of forgiving in that sense in that the more you use it, it's not going to become too soft. Um, there, and the only thing I would be mindful of is what I'm doing right now is just keep cleaning your hands. Um, because if you start to pick up other things when you're working with it and keep working with it, you're just going to maybe pick up dyes or dust in the clay, but it won't over soften it or anything like that. Um, that's a great question. Right. So if you okay. were done, thank you. Um, here, we would go ahead and move on to cutting, but I'm going to go ahead and place this aside over here. And then I'm going to show you guys a little bit about color mixing. So as I mentioned before, the earrings that I've created here were all custom colors that I created from some of the colors that you see here. So you may find some clay or have a color in mind that you want. I'll just wait for that to pass. I'll just clean this while we wait. And I'm gonna show you guys how I created this really beautiful minty green color. And that's from three different colors that you see here. So I'm going to show you about how, kind of how to do that. And what's really um, great is maybe you start with marbling and then you can use your scraps to kind of mix them into another color. Um, because the technique that you use for color mixing is the same that you use for marbling. Very simple, kind of similar process. So I'm going to go ahead and use white, the sunflower yellow, and the peppermint, which is a turquoise color. And to get that mint green, before I start, I'm gonna make sure my scraper, the little blade is nice and clean so I don't get the dark blue on there. And I'm gonna go ahead and grab my clay. And if you don't use all the clay in one sitting, that's okay, it keeps really well, but the most important part is going to be keeping it free from dust. So you can wrap it up back in the original packaging, but I like to keep that in like a sheet of plastic wrap or press and seal wrap it all up and then put that in a little Tupperware container so that way it stays nice and clean. But you don't have to be concerned about it over drying or anything like that. You can keep working with it. It may be a little bit, if you let it sit for a while, it may be a little bit hard next time you go to work with it or it may feel a little crumbly, but that just means you need to work with it a little bit more to make it more pliable the next time you go work with it. So I'm just gonna grab some colors. I'm gonna get two segments of white a yellow, and I'm going to start with half of a turquoise. Um, and it's kind of fun. It's just like mixing paint. If you have painted with acrylic or watercolor or anything like that, same rules apply as far as color mixing, you know, adding white to lighten the colors, adding black um, to darken the colors. This I'm going for green, so I'm obviously going to combine yellow and blue. But if you don't get it right away, that's okay. It's kind of, it's, it's very forgiving that you can just keep adding more to the mix. So I'm just right away gonna grab all these colors and just grab them with my hands to soften the clay a little bit. And you could use the technique of rolling again. But the end goal for this is to have one unanimous color. And it might seem kind of crazy at first, but it is definitely doable. So I'm just going to do the same marbling technique here. 
And just to speed things up because of time, I'm going to use the clay machine to color mix. But again, you can use the acrylic roller for all these different steps that I'm doing today. All right, so once I get that, I'm gonna put it in the clay machine, which again is on two millimeters. Rank it here and it's a really fun, almost tie-dye effect. I just folded it in half and I'm gonna run it back through the machine. And you actually just keep doing this multiple times. You'll see that time the color is really starting to blend. It's really creating a beautiful gradient. If you're interested in learning how to create a gradient or a blend from of two different colors, um, Sadler has a great video on their YouTube channel that demos that technique, as well as a few other ones for color mixing. I'm gonna go ahead and fold it in half and we're, we're getting there. I do see that maybe it's a little bit more yellow or kind of leaf green than I intended. So I could just go ahead and add a little bit more blue. I would recommend if it's not quite the color you want, start with maybe like a quarter of a section of one segment of clay until you get that color so you don't waste it. But one of the fun things about making earrings is what I do is I make all my earrings and then when I'm kind of done with the earrings, I take all those little scraps and that's what I use for bead making to make my statement necklaces. So this one is a little bit more yellow green than the example. So normally I would just add a little bit more blue, but um, because of time, I'm gonna go ahead and stick with this. So I'm just keep folding this in half and then in half again until the streaks are gone and it's one solid color. So I'm gonna go here. And again, you can use this. You would just do the same thing with the acrylic roller. Roll it and fold it. And I'm not using the scraper to lift up my pieces yet because it's just, I'm not kind of concerned about tearing the clay right now. It's one big piece. You're really gonna wanna use this one after we cut out the shapes because they can be a little delicate before we transfer them to a baking sheet. Okay, so I'm gonna go one more time. And there we go. So now we have one um, beautiful slab of a yellow green and you can keep working with this. You can actually set it aside. I have some that I rolled out a few, year, a few hours ago. It's not gonna dry out because it won't actually harden until you bake it in your oven. So we have a new custom color, a marble slab, which are great starting points for earrings. And that's kind of what I did for some of the earrings that you see here. But I'm going to show a couple other techniques that I absolutely love. So I'm going to grab this over here and show you here. So I rolled out, I think it was maybe one and a half segments of the white here. And then I took the, um, let's see, cognac brown, which is like a pr really pretty saddle color. And I used some scraps of clay to create little confetti. And this is like one of my favorite effects. And you'll see this is super popular. You'll see um, ready to wear earrings like this in stores. Um, it's a really popular trend and it is so easy to use or easy to create. So I've just rolled out a piece of white here. And then I just took some scraps that I had of the cognac color and no tools are needed except that original scraper blade. And I just use it to push down and cut the clay into little segments. And this is a great way to use up scrap colors you have or anything like that. And then I'm gonna use it again to cut the pieces into little triangles, rectangles, anything works here, depending on the look you want. It almost looks like um, terrazzo flooring, um, which I love. So you'll just want to go ahead and I'm just gently placing it. You don't have to score the clay before you add a pattern on there. You're just gonna place it on top and you can add as many colors as you want. Um, you could actually use the cutters that I'm gonna show you in just a little bit to cut out shapes, lay them on top and really customize the pattern. Um, there are tons of tutorials on YouTube for creating like leopard or animal prints as well. 
um, with the clay, which is super fun. So I'm just gonna show you guys what that looks like. So I'm gonna pick up my scraps over here. And then you'll either run it through the clay machine or use your acrylic roller. And you're just gonna kind of give it medium pressure to press the color that you just put on top into the base color. And you'll see right away, I mean, you can even feel it with my finger, it's in there, it's kind of all one clay. You don't have to worry about when you bake it, if it's gonna crack or fall out, they're now one piece of clay, which is a really fun technique. And you could add more colors, I could add more kind of, the marble pieces go in there, it's absolutely endless for doing this. If you were to use the clay machine, I would have just lifted it up, run it through the clay machine once, and you would have gotten the same uh, technique there. And then I'm gonna show you guys one more of my favorite technique, which I actually use in the earrings that I'm wearing right now. And I can show you as well here. And these earrings is gold leaf. Now gold leaf, you may have worked with before on other materials. Um, on pottery and things like that. Very similar method, but it's really easy to use with the Fimo soft clay because you can actually apply it before you bake the clay. And you can actually apply it after you bake the clay if maybe you bake a piece and then you're like, oh, you know what? It really could use some gold leaf to add a little bit of something extra after you bake it. You can still apply it. The only difference is if you apply the gold leaf sheets after you bake the clay, you're gonna have to use sizing which is kind of like a glue that Stadler sells that adheres the gold leaf to the piece. But when you've used it before, like I'm gonna use, you can just put it directly on top. So I'm gonna grab a piece that I already rolled out here. And this is just white. I want to make the contrast easy to see. And gold leaf comes in a big package. I believe it comes in silver, copper, and gold. Um, the FEMO team can jump in there if, if that's wrong. Um, but it's really delicate to work with. If there's any oils on your fingers, they are gonna stick to the leaf and it kind of tears. Um, but I just kind of roll with it when I work with it and let it happen more organically. But if you wanted this sheet to be totally gold, you would just lift the entire sheet and make sure it covers the entire clay surface. All you do is I have this little scrap piece here. I'm gonna gently press it into the clay. And as I do that, it's tearing it. So I'm gonna kind of create this abstract pattern here. And it's so thin that you almost can't even feel it. And you don't have to apply much pressure. You don't want to smush it with your fingers and affect the thickness of the clay. You just wanna be very gentle and apply it wherever you want. Maybe you just want a little bit. You just kinda of wanna be mindful maybe if you're going to then cut out the piece. Maybe if you only want it at the bottom of the earring shape or something like that, then you would just apply it to one side. You can kinda of see it sticking to my fingers here, but I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And then grab this over here. If there's any extra hanging off, it just tears really easily as soon as you lift it up. And then once you bake the clay, it's gonna be set in there. You don't have to worry about it totally peeling off or flaking too much as long as you've pressed it in there. You can give it a very gentle roll with the acrylic roller. Let me just make sure it's nice and clean. To just really ensure that it's on there. And then this piece would be ready to go ahead and cut out. I'm gonna cut half of it because I'm gonna show you guys one more technique in just a little bit later. Because actually you can infuse the clay with little gold um, bits that look more like confetti and it gives it almost like a texture. If you just then took this piece and rolled it all up and then either rolled it with an acrylic roller or with the clay machine, you can keep going with that and it gives it a totally different look. And I believe I can show you some pieces. Oh, here we go. Here's a bead that I did the exact same technique, but then I rolled it all up. And you can see that the gold, it almost looks like um, confetti in there or tile or stone. It's a totally different look than when it's directly on top. 
So the very last technique before we jump into cutting is something very fun. I'm gonna use this, the cognac color uh, clay that I already rolled out for this is you can use all sorts of texture tools and texture rollers to create texture on the clay. So you may want a very smooth piece and just kind of simulate texture with the marble look, which or with um, adding clay, layering clay like we did with the terrazzo look. You can also use other tools. Fimo makes a lot of different tools that um, have, they almost look like combs and they have like a tooth comb or a saw and they have um, little blades here. And you can use them to gently add lines. You can go zigzag and add, do, you kind of have to play with it and see if you just want straight lines and how much pressure. You can cross hatch and make them perpendicular. You can go diagonal. There's all sorts of different things. They're really fun to play with. And what's really fun is you can use tools specific to clay. And you can use other things. You may have a rubber stamp that you really love. You can actually use those to press them into the clay before cutting them out for jewelry making. Um, the possibilities are really endless. I'm gonna flip this over and roll it one more time to undo. So it is forgiving in that sense in that if you didn't like the texture that you created, just go ahead and fold it in half and roll it back out. And you'll notice, I'll show you guys right here, my clay right here has a little bit of that dark blue that we used earlier. You do want to be mindful of also cleaning out the clay machine before switching colors because it can pick up little bits that are in there. You just simply use a baby wipe or alcohol wipe to get in there and clean out the rollers. It's super simple. One of the things I'm going to show you guys that you may have seen off my table over here, these are wooden rollers that I purchased um, from different makers on Etsy. If you search for texture roller, these are intended I think for pottery, but they work so well for Fimo clay and there are thousands of them on there and they're so much fun to work with because they actually are just like a rolling pin but when you press down it leaves a patterned texture on the clay. It's a really beautiful effect. You can use it on solid colors, on the marble effect to add a little bit more um, detail on there and they're so much fun so I encourage you to check those out. Um, Fimo does make texture plates as well that you can get from them directly and they have a lot of different patterns and things like that. You may also see them as flat plates. If you do that, you just place your clay on the texture plate and then use your roller to roll on top to get the design into the clay. So that's super fun. So before we move into cutting, are there any um, questions or anything like that before we go on to the next step? Uh, okay. They're okay. They did just want to see the last, uh, I guess, details a bit closer, uh, what you worked yeah, on. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. I don't know. I'm looking on my computer. I don't know the lighting, if you guys can see. There we go. Can okay. you guys see that? I know it's not focusing super well, but there we go. So this okay. is kind of just like a... There we go. And I'll show you guys over here. I have some earrings that I started that I'll be working on that I used a different one. Let's see if it zooms in there. I'm not sure if it's picking up, but this one I'll show you guys over here was a starburst kind of Davy roller that I used on this piece here. Perfect. I think they're able to see it better. Thanks, Dara. Cool. Yeah. So really fun things to do. And again, the rubber stamps are a really fun way. Um, to add texture as well. So the next step is once you've got your colors and your clay rolled out is actually making the earrings. And there are a lot of different methods that you can use for this. But my favorite method um, is going to be using the cutters. Now my friend Rachel the Craft and Life and myself collaborated with Stadler and with Michaels to create a line of I think there's nine different cutters um, and they each have at least nine different pieces within the package of all these cutters that look like metal cookie cutters, but they're intended to use for the clay. And they are absolutely amazing for making jewelry. They're a great starting point. And um, if you're not sure what you wanna make or kind of what, if you're new to jewelry making, but the possibilities are endless because you can combine the shapes to make really beautiful pieces. So I'm gonna use some of my favorite ones here today. 
and show you guys a few techniques of using the cutters. If you don't have the cutters, um, which I still encourage you to get because they're just such a great, uh, great value, you can also just use your blade to cut out the clay by simply, like if you wanna just rectangular pieces, you could just use the clay to cut, or excuse me, use the blade to cut out the clay. So you can really, this tool is just so awesome because it's, it's so functional, but it's also great for actually creating the pieces. Another technique you can use is actually printing out templates out of like paper, cutting out the shapes you want and then laying them directly, very gently, directly on top of the clay. And you can use a craft knife to actually cut around the clay if you wanted a very specific uh, shape that maybe wasn't available in the cutters. So that's another uh, option you have as well. But I'm just gonna show you guys kind of a rectangular piece here. So I just used the blade for that. If I wanted just long like drop earrings, I could just cut it in half. Um, if you wanna get really technical and if you're super detail oriented, um, a lot, one fun technique I've seen is using graph paper laid on top of your pieces. That helps you get nice, sharp, um, 90 degree corners on all the pieces because you're using the graph paper as a template. Um, so if you're interested in just creating rectangles and squares, that's definitely a great a way to go. And I'm gonna show you guys on the green, I think it'll be a little bit easier to see over here. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this is from the horseshoe set one thing you want to be mindful of before you use the cutters is they have like a thicker edge at the top that's going to indicate which side is the top you want that side on the top when you press down and the thinner side to be the side going into the clay this one i used a little bit earlier on the brown so i'm going to just wipe it off and this is going to be just like cookie making cookies for the holidays you're just going to press into the clay Sometimes when you lift it up, it may be stuck in there, especially if you're working with little circles like that, that's okay. You can just use a little tool, like a little stick or you're gonna chop stick to kind of gently push that out. But usually it will stick to your surface. So I'm just gonna push this here. I'm gonna go ahead and use my scraper to cut away this extra piece because we could use that later. And then, I'm gonna pull away the negative space or the clay around the shapes that I cut out just very gently here. And you'll see now I have two uh, beautiful horseshoe shapes. I'm gonna use the scraper to gently pick it up. Again, this is where this, you wanna use the scraper tools for this. If you just grabbed it, you may um, distort the shape for the clay. So I'm just gonna pick it up gently on my scraper tool and you can see that I have it there. Now, one thing you might notice right away is that the edges, and I can kind of see if I can show you here, the edges might be a little bit rougher than you intended. It's totally okay and it's just kind of part of the material, but it's um, totally easy to smooth. So one of my favorite things to do is before I bake this piece, so if I just wanted to go ahead and did not add any texture, just wanted this as is, but I noticed it was a little rough. I would just use my finger to gently smooth out the edges. This isn't going to get it maybe as smooth as you want or get everything, but it does get kind of those little crumbly edges. They kind of just fall right off when you gently do this on the piece. For the horseshoes and things that are a little bit more delicate, you don't want to do too much because you don't want to distort the shape. Um, because you can actually sand the pieces after they're baked. And I'm going to show you that in just a little bit. But this is a great way to avoid a lot of sanding is just using your fingers to smooth out the edges there. So I would then take this piece and place it on my tray. And I'm going to show you guys one more and then we'll talk about baking. So I'm gonna show you guys another technique. Let's go ahead and work with this. I think this will be so fun. I'm gonna move this out of the way so we can see this over here. So I'm gonna clean off my scraper before I pick up these colors that have the white clay in them. And I'll move this over here. And I noticed it's on the back there, but that's okay. I'm gonna use the 
cutters. So when you're using like the um, pattern, the gold leaf, the marble, you want to be mindful of where you place your cutter because you may want it, you know, to be a darker piece, a lighter piece. It just kind of depends on what look you're going for. So you can really have a lot of control with what your pieces look like. And I love how organic it is and how they will vary from left to right um, and from piece to piece. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and cut out two here and then I'll use my tool. And we are gonna save all that because we can use that for our bead making later. And I'm gonna cut this in half, make it a little bit easier to pull away the extra clay. And it is so fun. So the earrings that I'm wearing here are created with this cutter. I use the gold white and gold leaf, but I wanna show you guys the technique that I use to create it. So I just use the daisy shape, and then you can actually punch out kind of the negative, or kind of create a negative space within the piece before you bake it. So that is really fun. Um, I'm not sure if I have it here, but you could then use, one of my favorite shapes is this, kind of scalloped teardrop, you could use that and then use one of the teardrops that we have and create a hoop easily. You could easily create a hoop with two circles. Um, that's just an easy way to do that. So it's really, really endless what shapes you can do. Just kind of depends on what look you're going for. Okay, I'm gonna clean this off. You'll notice that the inside is still in there. That's okay. We're gonna punch that out when I lift it up. The daisy shape looks a little bit smoother than our previous one, but I still go in with my fingers and gently just kind of touch, I'm like very gently just touching the edges to help smooth them out. Then I would just lift it up before I put move it to my baking sheet and gently take out the center. And I actually like keeping those little bits because they make great um, stud earrings. You could use them to, as if you wanted this as a two-part earring, as a connector piece, they're really great. So I like to go ahead and bake those as well, especially if I'm making a collection of pieces, maybe you rolled out your favorite color clay and you wanna make a bunch of different earrings. It's really fun to just um, maximize what you can make with it all in one shot. So I'm gonna go ahead and move this to my baking sheet. So now I wanna tell you guys a little bit about baking the clay. It's the only way, I'll move that out of the way. It's the only way to harden the clay is going to be baking it in the oven. And I have a few uh, tips and tricks for you guys before you bake the clay. One thing is, is that if I was gonna work one afternoon, maybe you're having a craft afternoon at night, you wanna go ahead and just make all your pieces and you can load them up you don't have to worry about them drying them out. You don't have to bake them in a certain amount of time as you're working. So what I, uh, my favorite method is going to be using just a baking sheet. I'm using a quarter sheet pan here because I like to use my toaster oven. So I'm so hot outside, I don't wanna turn on my full oven, but you can use a toaster oven, an oven to bake this. Um, either one will work. I'm using a uh, aluminum baking sheet lined with parchment paper. That's my favorite way to bake my pieces because if you line the pan with foil, um, after you bake the pieces, the foil will actually create like a shiny look on the back side of the pieces, um, which maybe that's the look you're going through for. Um, but if you want them to look the most uniform or same on front and back, I recommend going with a piece of parchment paper, not wax paper, parchment paper that's oven safe. So I just cut this sheet in here and it is gonna be, I would just load up as many pieces as I want. And with the Fimo soft clay on the package, you'll notice right there, it tells you exactly the temperature and the length of time. It's 230 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes. So you wanna preheat your oven. If you do have a convection oven, you wanna turn off the convection feature if you can, and um, that's gonna give it the most uniform baking um, when you do that. If your oven um, is old or you know the temperature setting maybe isn't accurate or it's a little wonky, um, FEMO does sell this little um, thermometer that is 
oven safe. You just place it in your oven as you're preheating and you can get the most accurate temperature um, on there. And it is in Celsius and Fahrenheit in there, which are both listed on the package as well. So this is a handy tool. If you know that the oven that you're using, it might be a little bit off. So after you place them in the oven, you just pop them in the oven, bake them for the 30 minutes, and then you want them to cool completely before moving on to the next step. Now, I've gotten a lot of questions um, before about when to add holes, because when you're making earrings, if you're connecting multiple pieces or even just using fish hooks like I did for these earrings, you obviously need a hole to connect the metal binding onto the piece. Now, there's several different ways to do this. Um, I've kind of tested several different ones and I'll show you guys my favorite methods. For all the earrings that you see up here, I actually added the holes before baking. And what that looked like is using these tools, it's called a bead piercing tool, and they're sold in a big set like this from FEMO. These are available at Michael's. And these are just like what they say. They're intended for making holes in beads, but they also work well for jewelry making. If you were gonna use these, especially if you're interested in bead making, I feel like this is the best way to go because you can use the tool for making beads and flat pieces like these earrings. What you would do is just gently press this into the clay and rotate it slightly. And kind of spin it around to create the hole. Now, you may wonder like, okay, well, why are there so many different methods? This works really well for making really tiny holes. Um, however, when you make the holes, you'll notice, especially if you're doing it while you're baking or while you're on your work surface, when you transfer it, they can distort a little bit. And even they can vary in size from piece to piece because you're doing it by hand. These are my favorite tools for bead making, but my preferred method is actually making the holes after I bake the pieces. So I'm gonna show you guys what that looks like. And again, there's no really right or wrong way. If these are the tools that you have, absolutely go with it. Like I said, I used um, that to make all the holes before baking all the jewelry pieces that you see up there. But I am gonna show you guys um, a really nice method as well. So let's go ahead, I'm gonna grab these pieces up here. Whichever method you're using to make the holes on your pieces, you just want to be mindful of not putting the holes too close, I'm going to move that over, too close to the edge. Because if they're too close to the edge of any piece, when you go to add the, um, the jump rings or the posts later on, they could actually tear the clay. So you want to get them a couple millimeters inside of the piece. And unfortunately, um, the first time I was doing this, I learned the hard way and I made a bunch of pieces and I made all the holes too close. They ended up tearing. And then I had to uh, make them again. So if you are, if this is your very first pair of earrings, um, what I recommend doing is maybe making one pair, um, testing, making the holes, testing them out so you know exactly um, that you nailed the spot where it needs to go. So the other, these pieces I went on and baked for 30 minutes, they're totally cool. They're three different pieces. I use the um, Daisy um, texture roller on these, but I wanna show you guys two other methods. So one method you can use is actually using a hole punch. Now this punch is not the standard one that's just for notebook paper. This is made by Fiskars, it's also available at Michaels. And it, the little hole that you see right there is 1 16th of an inch large. So I actually have one of these, I think over there in eighth of an inch, um, which is what I used for making little sliding hair clips as well. If you were in that workshop a couple weeks ago, um, that this one is a little bit smaller and I found it to be the perfect size for connecting the pieces, for using the jump rings and other things like that. Um, it works really well, but you do want to kind of be mindful of where it punches. So again, you don't want to punch the hole too close to the edge. So you just want to use the guide in there. And you can even, if you want to be really technical, you could mark it with a pencil before you punch. So I'm just going to place it in here. And then I'm going to punch down and it punches right in there. If you are using the Fiskars punch, 
I like to place my piece right side up as I'm punching because I found that sometimes it will leave a little bit of a mark on the back side from the actual punch. So that's one method you can see right here. I'll show you guys. I've created the hole and I know it looks so tiny, but it's actually the perfect size for the jump rings. If I were going to connect these pieces, I would then just place one here using the same method. I'm just gonna eye it and then I'll punch it together. Super easy, um, easy to use. The hole punch will not work if your pieces are quite thick. Like I would say maybe um, an eighth of an inch or thicker, I wouldn't go the hole punch route. You would either want to, before baking, use the bead piercing needles or use the last method that I'm gonna show you guys. So we'll go ahead and do that. The last method, especially if your pieces are a lot thicker, um, like some of the pieces, I think these might be a little bit thicker that I created. Um, you want to use a drill. Now this is a hand drill. Um, these tools I think are available on Michael's on their website, super affordable. And basically it's a hand drill or it looks almost like a screwdriver, more like a screwdriver. And it comes with a set of tons of different drill bits. And these I think maybe intended initially for um, resin jewelry making, but were great with baked polymer clay pieces. If you use one of these tools, um, you want to grab, I have over here, a scrap piece of wood because you don't want to be pushing this into a hard surface. It could break the drill bit, really damage your piece or something like that. So I'm just using this little scrap piece of plywood that I have here. And you place your piece on there. You place your drill bit in there. Another option I've seen some people do is they actually use a craft knife, like an X-Acto knife or a Fisker's blade and put a drill bit that you may already have um, as part of your kind of home improvement kit. You can actually place that in the same kind of tool and it works the same way. So there are a lot of different options for this, but you just wanna make sure that your tool is upright. You don't wanna angle it because that could um, kind of create a wonky hole. And then you also want to um, make sure, again, that you're not too close to the edge of the piece because you don't want the jump ring or other piece to tear. So you just press in and go clockwise. And it almost looks like wood chips coming up, kind of spiraling off. That's just the clay material until you can feel that you're in the wood. I'll show you guys. There it is. And then I'm just gonna go counterclockwise, take it out. And then you guys can see that I created a hole. If you are jumping in and wanna make a lot of different pieces, um, this tool is a great option because of the different drill bits, gives you different diameter holes you can make. But you may, if you're into paper crafting, maybe you already have one of these punches as well, circle punches, works great as well. Kind of just depends on what tools you have. All three methods really work, work really well and help you create really great pieces. So I would not be, worried about having all the tools, just use which of the tools that you have. So before we kind of assemble all these, I want to talk a little bit more about sanding the pieces. So we, as you remember, once before we bake the pieces, we use our fingers to gently smooth out the edges. But you may see, especially I can see right here, there's a little bit of some rough edges that you may want to smooth out before you actually assemble the pieces and make them ready to wear. So you can actually use sandpaper to sand the pieces. And I'll show you guys these sheets. I cut these in half, but these are sandpaper, three different grits um, from fine to ultra fine that are made by Stabler Female and they're available at Michael's and they're part of the collection. I cut them in half because I'm working with so many small pieces. I found them a lot easier to work with when they're small. And I'll show you guys, I wrote the um, grits over here. Um, one thing you wanna do is when you're sanding, you wanna start with the coarsest one, which is gonna be the lowest number and work your way up. 
And when you're working with polymer clay, you can actually go up to like, even end up at 3000. Um, and those sandpapers you can get at home improvement stores. If you really want to have a nice polished smooth piece that almost feels like acrylic or something like that. Um, but these are great starting point and I found them to be um, really helpful when I'm working with the sandpaper. Now you might be wondering why I have a bowl of water. We actually dip the sandpaper, I'm going to start with the lowest number, the 240, in water before sanding our piece. This is going to help kind of reduce the amount of dust around there and just help it work a little bit better. And I'm just using sandpaper, I'm using the edges, or sanding the edges, excuse me, and I'm just going back and forth, working my way around. And you'll notice instantly that it feels a lot smoother. You don't want, if you have sandpaper lying around the house, you don't want to use a sandpaper that's um, any lower or coarser than I'd say 240, because if you use like 120, it would actually really scratch the piece and create um, very visible lines on the sides. So the key is starting out kind of high, which is already considered a fine sandpaper and working to an ultra fine sandpaper. So you kind of just go, and this is your preference. It depends on how smooth you want your piece. Since I use the texture roller on this, I'm not gonna sand the front of the piece. I wanna keep that texture. But if I did have a piece like this one right here, I could actually use this in a circular motion, I'll dip it back in there, to sand it off. If you're wondering kind of, well, do I need to keep going? What does it look like? Just grab a paper towel or cotton rag and you can dry it off. Really easy way to get it nice and smooth. Once you've used a 240, if you want it, you're just like, no, it's still a little rough, go ahead and work your way up to a finer one. Dip it in the water and go ahead and keep sanding. And you can actually do this before you make the holes. Um, if you're not sure maybe how you're gonna assemble the pieces, maybe you're creating stud earrings or something like that, you can totally sand them. You just wanna do this after you bake the pieces. So I'm just gonna go through and you'll see, I can feel right away that it's really nice and smooth there. If I want a little smoother, I'm gonna work my way up to the 360, which is the ultra fine one that comes in this pack. And keep going. And again, um, if you're creating smooth pieces like the marble or the terrazzo look, or even um, the ones that are layered like that, what you want to do is actually use the circular motion to polish the front of the piece. Because sometimes even though we use the roller or the clay machine, it may still be a little uneven, especially for pieces like the terrazzo look that were layered together. Even though I can barely feel it, when you bake it, it still might kind of look like um, that it's two pieces of clay layered on top of each other. So by polishing it, especially working all the way up to the ultra fine sandpaper, it's gonna look like one solid piece, almost like resin or um, marbled or colored acrylic piece. It's gonna look like one uniform um, piece and nice and smooth and really give you pro professional results. So I'm gonna go ahead and make sure, I know we're running out of time here. So the last thing I'm gonna, show before we move on is assembling. Now I'm going to show you guys a few different ways to assemble the pieces and the basic tools that you need to invest in which are um, really affordable and available at Michaels are tiny little pliers and you may already have pliers at home but these are tiny little pliers that are perfect for jewelry making and over here I have jump rings in a couple different sizes. Those are just the name from the metal jump rings to connect pieces. I have stud earring posts and earring backs as well. And what you do to connect them, I'll show you guys over here real quick, is you're gonna go ahead and grab with one pair of pliers, grab, hold the jump ring. I'll show you, again, show you guys over here. And then I'm gonna grab the other jump ring and I'm gonna pull it away from the other one so it gently opens up the ring. I can then place my piece inside. 
I like to place my piece face down and I'll show you why. Because when I go to close it up, actually, let me go ahead and add this piece just to show you guys. Add it here. And it can be a little, a little funny. I'll get the hang of it. I like to work on the back side of the piece so that my pliers don't accidentally scratch the piece that I maybe just worked so hard to polish. So then you just take the other plier, um, and I'm left-handed, so I'm doing this with my left hand, and I just close the ring. And now my piece is connected. These are, I believe, six millimeters and eight millimeter diameters. They come in a bunch of different sizes. Just depends on um, what kind of pieces you're connecting. If I'm connecting clay, I really like using the six millimeter piece. But one option you have is Michaels sells, as part of the bead landing collection, all these really beautiful metal pieces that I love mixing and matching with my clay pieces. So you can see here, there are some really um, fun pieces. There's even these awesome horseshoe pieces. And if you're using those, like I added those to this earring here, you may want to use a little bit smaller jump ring. And I think we only have a couple more minutes, so I'm going to show you guys the last step. And if there's any questions, please uh, let me know now as I'm doing that. Hi, Sarah. Um, yes. One question I um, was just uh, wondering about the type of metal um, that you'd recommend for the wire the studs if you want to just give some information on what your recommendations would be yeah for sure so all the ones that i've um that are here are available from michaels and i believe they're all either surgical steel or aluminum um, but the most important thing is that almost all the jewelry pieces that they sell including the jump rings are nickel free i know nickel is a very common allergy i'm personally allergic to nickel so you don't have to worry about this um, I did get some jump rings from Michaels that are gold plated, 14 karat gold plated that were still very affordable. That's one option. You just want to be mindful of um, them being nickel free, which again, almost all the ones available from Michaels are, including the post. When you're ready to go ahead and add the post, I like to use a um, super glue. The, my favorite one that I found is actually the Gorilla Glue Gel, which is also available at Michaels to apply the post to the back of the earring. You just want to allow it to dry according to the um, directions of the package. I like to go for a full 24 hours before wearing my earrings. And then in the last minute, the last thing I wanted to show you guys is the um, way to use up your scraps is to make really fun statement necklaces. This is a piece that I use the leather effects clay to use the same little daisy um, cutter to create a flat piece and turned it into a bead. And then I just rolled up my scrap pieces with my hands and using the um, cutters is a great way to measure it if you're creating multiple beads so that way you know exactly how much material you're using. But I roll it into a little circle and then I just use my scraper tool, either one, to just gently press and it creates this nice little donut shape. And then I use my bead piercing tool to wiggle it around there and I'll flip it over and do both sides and create a nice little bead. And I love these. They almost look like Cheerios or Fruit Loops and they look really fun in a small size stacked up on a leather cord like I've done. You can do it on a metal um, chain necklace as well. There's a lot of options, but this is a really fun way to use up some of your scrap colors. Um, you can still add gold leaf onto this um, and customize it more, but it's a really fun way to then have maybe matching necklace and earring set. So before we wrap up, are there any other questions? Um, I think you've answered most of them. Everyone really enjoyed the class. One last one that just came through was uh, in terms of the bead, how would you recommend uh, putting it in the oven? Um, yeah. Depends, if you're going with a flat, like Fruit Loop Cheerio bead like I created, I put these directly oops, on my baking sheet as is. I just gently bake it like that. Same time. If you are creating round beads, like the ones you see here, these are actually ready-made beads as part of the collection. If you don't, if they don't have a flat side, my favorite method is to take a oven safe mug, a ceramic mug, place my beads. Let me grab that one to show you guys. 
you'll actually use the bead piercing tool, place this on there so that way there's not a flat side creating an indent on your bead. And then you would place the entire mug with the bead piercing tool and your clay beads in the oven. You just want to allow it to cool completely in the oven before removing it because the mug will be hot. But that's the best way that I found to create round beads. But if you're using the flat technique, that works really well. So if there aren't any questions, um, feel free to ask me some questions. Um, you can find me at Sarah Hearts on all social media. And then you can also be sure to follow um, Stadler as well. It's the account is Stadler. Um, North America on Instagram. And again, if you created anything in this class or in the future, please tag us with hashtag myfemale or hashtag stadler underscore NA. And thank you so much for joining me. It was so much fun and I cannot wait to see what you guys create.